Amelia and I are spending a sunny afternoon exploring some of the most remote areas of the new property that we have purchased and are now living in the quaint old house upon. We are wearing gardening gloves and are dressed in long sleeve shirts and wide-brimmed hats as we get to work at our new homesteading activity. We're walking through the forest, and the wind is making the leaves rustle, and I can feel a cooling breeze on my face as I see ahead that the trees are falling away and opening into a field, the grass meeting the tree line over by some bramble and underbrush. Amelia's already over there with a shovel, ready to put in a little vegetable garden. Amelia is using her shovel to clear some of the grass at the base of a hillock and has just hit something metal with it. She looks to me and frowns. Michael, what do you make of this? I step over to her, curious, and kneel down to brush some of the loose dirt away. It's not a rock or root as it might otherwise appear, but rather some rusted iron surface. I clear more dirt away, revealing a wider section of it, and glance over to her. I keep at it with the shovel, methodically clearing the dirt from around it and exposing more and more of it to the light of day. I'm not sure how much time has passed, an hour, maybe more, when we finally uncover it, the huge age-blackened metal door set flush within the ground. It's six feet tall, four feet wide, and comfortably big enough for a man to step through without having to bend very much. It looks like it's made of thick, solid iron and is likely designed to be able to take a great deal of abuse or to keep something from getting out. The door is rectangular and rounded at the corners, and has an old-world charm about it, looking like it was built back during the age of civil defense and Cold War tensions. The surface of it is covered in a fine tracery of rust, detailing the ebb of many years exposed to the elements and general decay. At the center of the door is a large round hatch wheel, rusted and time-worn, its grooves nearly filled with rusted patina. I assume this wheel is what was used to lock the door and create an airtight seal. I wonder if it's a storage cellar or something, Amelia says, running her fingers along the rusted, age-worn latch. Not sure, I say, eyeing the entrance. We share a nod of agreement and push inside. The latch reluctantly releases, and the heavy door set swings open with a long, creaking groan, the dank, dark shadows of the interior opening up and leading down into the passage beyond. The air is heavy with the smell of damp earth and age. We pull our phone out and turn on the flashlight, illuminating the steps leading down into the darkness. The walls are solid concrete, and the temperature is noticeably cooler than when we left the hot summer day outside behind us. I take Amelia's hand in a tight grip, giving it an encouraging squeeze as we look down into the black stairway that descends below ground. We continue carefully down into the bunker, my eyes adjusting to the diminished light from the entrance above, shrinking to a small disk of brilliance within the increasing darkness. I take a deep breath, and we step inside the bunker, the sunlight disappearing from behind us as we close the door. The sounds of our footsteps in the confined area are eerie, and I feel as if we are intruding upon something, some long-past historical event. The stairwell is narrow and requires us to move down them single file. I lead the way, with Amelia behind me and her hand resting on my shoulder. The walls around us are illuminated by our flashlights, and we see that they are of rough concrete construction, untreated and corroding from years of weather and damp. I can make out patches of moss and clumps of tiny mushrooms on the wall as we go. The stairwell ends after maybe twenty steps, and we find ourselves in a larger area. Shining our lights around, we see that this room is fairly well lit, with darkness in the corners here and there. It is an open area, larger than we had thought might be here, and when we shine our lights down to confirm, we can see the cracks throughout the cold, dusty, and debris-covered floor of the concrete. Wooden shelves line the far wall, covered with what looks to be a random assortment of things, and an old metal desk, rusted with age, sits along the side of them, with an antique lamp sitting on the edge of it. An old armchair in the corner has been left to the moths, with faded and torn upholstery where once it was bright and new, and dusty what looks to have been quite recently. I spot a small table nearby, upon which sits a dusty radio. Opposite that I see a rusty metal cot, 
stripped of its bedding, looking oddly unused in the room. More discarded bits of past life litter the floor of the room as we step farther within. Chipped dishes, a frayed area rug, and a heap of books splayed out in disarray. Each one seems to pulse with the life that was lived here, like they are all memories, just waiting for someone to notice them. It's way too quiet, nothing but the sounds of our breath and the muted scuffle of our collective steps upon the concrete floor. On the wall near the staircase, there is a rusty rectangular metal plate with a black toggle switch on it. Amelia, check this out, I say, shining my flashlight on it. She raises the flashlight to the object, eyeing it in the low light. Is that a switch? Could be worth a shot, I reply, stepping closer to the switch. Without a word, we both look at each other, asking the same question. What if it does work? What if this bunker powers up and starts revealing its secrets to us? I don't know whether it's exciting or terrifying. Amelia nods. Do it, she says, both excitement and fear in her gaze. I take a deep breath and extend my hand to the switch, turning it. There's a momentary delay, and then the old socketed bulbs in the ceiling buzz to life, casting dusty yellow light throughout the room and banishing the shadows to the edges of the area. We blink a few times, eyes adjusting to the sudden brightness, and take in the bunker that we had seen only by the narrow cones of our flashlights. We start to investigate the rest of the bunker in more detail, at first separately, both drawn to different areas of the space. Amelia crosses over to the wooden shelving, eyeing the stacks of tapes and files with interest. She picks up a few of the older-looking recordings on the bottom shelf and dusts them off a bit, looking at the faded labels. These appear to be reel-to-reel -reel tapes, she says, and I can hear the room echo with her words. I take a few steps toward the desk and look at the papers scattered upon it. There are all sorts of things here, including various handwritten notes, all yellowed with age, and some of them are just little more than grocery lists or napkin-jotted reminders or daily chore lists and the like. A few of them are more involved, some sort of observation or musing or self-reflection, but all are written in a very neat and purposeful script throughout. It's all done very old school, with precise and clear lettering in all of them. At least a half dozen maps are spread out on the desk before me. There are regular road maps of the local regions, and some sort of topographical maps adorned with hand-scrawled notes and foreign symbols. One map detailing our immediate local area has been marked up with different colored pens to highlight certain landmarks and connect them with other places that, on the surface at least, look to be arbitrary. There's a blueprint here on top of the maps, and I think it's of our house and the property. I laid out the blueprint on the less cluttered portion of the desk, the yellowed paper smelling of musty age and covered with a complex and accurate inked representation. The printout is divided into two sections. The top half of the page is a very detailed architectural drawing of our dwelling, identifying rooms and hallways, but the bottom half is something very different and very interesting. It demonstrates a complex layout of the bunker we're in now, beneath where we are living in our new house. It's not too hard to miss the entrance to the bunker and the way the stairwell would open into this room, but we're stuck at a rectangular room. This is pretty much where I got lost on the blueprint, but there should be a desk, shelves, and a cot of some sort on it. At the far end of the room opposite the stairwell, there are two narrow sets of lines that look like hallways that lead off. I can't see the hallways here, but they might be obscured by the old shelves. The blueprints show the hallways extend quite a way. The first hallway, labeled Corridor A on the blueprint, branches off into a number of smaller rooms, names uninspiredly as Room 1, Room 2, and the like, with varying sizes and seemingly no rhyme or reason. The second hall, or Corridor B according to the signs, opens into two larger rooms. One is marked Storage and is covered with little pictograms that indicate shelves or boxes of some sort. The other is labeled Utilities and I would guess that's where the power generation and mechanical systems are located for the bunker. I look up from the blueprint and cast my gaze across the room to the wall of the cabin. 
Now, there is a great mystery here. This is no single room filled with old tapes and notebooks, but a complex of rooms and halls, and all of them need exploring. There's a small metal box on the desk, but it's locked and I don't have a key for it. It looks pretty scratched and beat up and the lock is all rusty. In a tarnished frame, a dusty and faded photograph of what may have been the previous middle-aged resident of the house, stern-faced and with penetrating eyes, hair neatly combed back and dressed in a simple white shirt. Next to it, on one side, is a photo of it, and to the other is an outdated desk lamp with its light bulb expired years ago. The last item is an old rotary dial telephone, some of the cord neatly coiled beside it. It's unplugged and looks like such an antique that I'm not sure it would even work if it were plugged in. After some independent searching, we reconvene in the center of the room and decide to share the recordings and journals, collectively determining to use them to learn what we can about the former denizen of the bunker and to get a better picture of our new home below. With that in mind, we set up a small workspace on the desk and used our phone to take notes and document our findings. We began with the tapes and figured out how to use the antiquated reel-to-reel -reel player that I'd found in a drawer of the desk. We're... we're sitting at the desk now. There's a curious mix of anticipation and anxiety. I slide the first reel into the player, and the ancient machine starts whirring. The next one you play has a person coughing, and then a man with a very deep and clear voice and way too formal of an accent says, Log 1. I recognize this one as the fellow in the picture on the desk. He continues, Monday, September 8th. I have decided to maintain these logs in this manner, recording my day-to-day -day activities and thoughts. I find that the isolation here compels me to reach out, even if only to the silence of the bunker. In the beginning, they sound like the thoughts and ramblings of any man. He writes about moving out of the city and out into the country, and how peaceful and quiet it is out here, and the things he does every day. He writes about the simple loveliness of the landscape and how sad it makes him, so you feel sorry for him. The next ones are a little different in nature as we progress. 52, he says aloud. I find myself more and more intrigued with the study of the human mind and how it can house such darkness and how normalcy can perform such atrocities. The comparison between saint and sinner is most curious. The next one presents a similar view. Entry 53. The mind is like the bunker, is it not? Concealed compartments, hidden from the outside world, filled with secrets, fears, desires, memories, every hallway, every room within the mind. Moving on to additional recordings, he provides more context. This is Entry 57. I have spent much time studying the minds of serial killers, learning their rationalization for their behaviors. While most believe them to be monsters, they were pioneers to me, pushing the boundaries of the human condition and exploring areas others would not. I found it all very exciting. He sounds excited now. This is number 61. It is a very invigorating thing to outthink and outmaneuver a person, especially when it is a matter of life and death. I can understand why they do it, the power it gives, the control it offers. It is very interesting. Things start getting a little ominous when he starts talking about his own desires. Recording 6th 5. Is it wrong that I wish for the experiences of these men? To crave the power, the control, to be the puppet master? Morality is a construct, and it is flexible. The man in the next recording sounds creepily calm. 78 entry, I said aloud. Fortnight since I last spoke with the delivery man. He came here to make a delivery and hadn't the faintest idea of what he was coming into. The idiot. Another brief silence, then a muted sound of movement, as if he was shifting some papers. I welcomed him in and offered him a drink. This one looked a bit tired, like he'd been working all day. He was glad for the drink when I gave it to him, and even tipped his hat and sat at the table. It wasn't long before I had his drink spiked, and soon enough his eyes glazed and his words slurred before I knew he was unconscious. His voice is still even, without emotion. I took him to the bunker. In those surroundings, I wielded a power that I had never known. 
the exhilaration of total control, of having his life at my mercy. I cannot explain to you how intense it was. The recording went on. I played with him, letting him wake a few times. His horror when he found himself bound and helpless and his begging for mercy were, well, intoxicating. I was the cat, and he was the mouse, and, unlike our usual antisocial cat friends, I wasn't letting him go. It happened faster than I would have liked, but it was educational, eye-opening, exhilarating. I think I need to do it again. When the recording is over, we just sit there quietly. I don't know what to say, so I don't say anything, but a prurient dread has me reaching for the next recording. Uh, yeah, uh, entry number 84, he stammered. It, uh, it has been three weeks now since the, uh, the delivery man, since the, uh, the man was taken, uh, from the world. He looked up at me with fear in his eyes. The, uh, the truth is, it's, uh, it's not that, um, that, uh, no one has, um, uh, missed him. No one, uh, nobody has even, uh, uh, asked about him. No family, uh, come to check on him. Uh, no, uh, uh, no detectives have been making, uh, any inquiries. He shook his head, looking away sadly. It, uh, doesn't make any sense, uh, how he could just, um, disappear like that, uh, but well, I, uh, I guess he has. Again, he pauses a moment before continuing. Yesterday, I took my next step. I found a young woman, a hitchhiker, stranded out on the highway. She was such a waif, lost and far from her home, but I was able to persuade her to come into my car without fear. She was very trusting, very innocent. It was almost... disappointing. I told her I needed to swing by my house real quick before we headed into town, and she agreed without hesitation. But I could see the tension begin in her as I directed her into my house. She looked like a startled bird, stepping into a snare. I gave her a drink, like the delivery man did. She hesitated for a moment when she took the glass from me, but it was too late. The trial had already taken hold, and she was looking confused now as she tried to rise and shout. Her body wouldn't cooperate with her commands, and a moment later, she passed out. I brought her to the bunker, the same spot where the delivery man had died. This time, I wanted to draw it out a bit more, savor it a little longer. The fright when she first came to, the terror in her eyes, the futility of her attempts to escape. It was all very exhilarating. When her time to die came, I made it quick, but not before I took all her fear and all her begging for mercy, like this. But I think it was the fear that was the best intoxication. It felt very strong when I was doing the main thing in her worst dreams. Yes. And that's the weird thing. Two down. But this is something more. He says it all strangely in the bunker. We both just sit there in silence for a long moment, and I can feel the weight of my words settling heavily into the stifling quiet of the bunker. We brace ourselves for it as I hit play on the next one. The voice of the man comes through the static, almost upbeat. 91st entry, he says. It is interesting how adaptable we are as humans, how quickly the abnormal can become normal. I have grown quite used to my... my... expeditions. He tells it with some relish this time. This one was another salesman, a very personable gentleman, that was going door to door trying to sell me a vacuum cleaner. He never even knew what hit him. I gestured for him to come in and do a demonstration of his product, and I could see the excitement in his eyes at the thought of possibly making a sale. I started the vacuum cleaner and asked him if he wanted a drink. He turned from the machine and took a step toward me, accepting the glass of water, and I focused on him intently, just waiting for the drugs to begin to affect him. He goes on with his confession. Pretty quickly, though, his jerky movements started slowing, his eyes began to droop, and he began slurring his speech. He just sort of pitched forward onto the living room floor, and all at once, the vacuum cleaner noise seemed really loud in the sudden quiet. I dragged him down into the bunker, into my hidden refuge. When he awoke, the mask of the salesman was gone, and I saw the fear there. 
He pleaded and cried and screamed, and it didn't matter. There was no one aside from us, within the sound-deadening confines of the bunker. I just made it last a little longer. I just wanted to frighten him and control him a little bit longer. I didn't end it any faster than the others. I just ended it. The last thing he says is even more chilling. That's the end of log number 91. I'll speak with you again, next time. Trailing into that same stifling quiet of the bunker. I pivot to Amelia and can see the color has drained from her face and likely from mine as well. The stillness within the bunker is so loud when I speak up. I don't understand. This man, he was a demon, I say, and my words rebound from the walls within the confined space. Amelia is quiet for a long moment before she nods, her voice little more than a whisper. We have to tell the police about this, Michael. They have to know. Yeah, I say, thinking. But we should search the rest of this bunker first. There might be, well, more evidence. Amelia takes a deep breath and nods. Okay, but we have to be careful. Who knows what else is down here? We meet back up, the sounds of those recordings still fresh in our ears. Amelia and I return to the desk and study the blueprint once more. The intricate lines and symbols on the plan show us where two hallways, marked as Corridor A and Corridor B, are located at the far end of this room. We decide to check out Corridor A. The wall looks to be a solid section of the bunker, with no obvious door or entrance in the area of the blueprints as we approach it. But as I get closer, I can make out a faint shadow where the impossibly rough surface of the concrete seems to shadow some sort of doorway. A hidden small switch, the blueprint tells me. They made it look like one of the little irregular bumps in the wall, and I hear the low rumble of a hidden door sliding aside. Whatever it is, Amelia grips my hand a little tighter and looks to it with a bit of fear in her eyes as more dust and ancient grime falls from the wall as it moves. After a moment, the rumbling subsides and a small rectangular hole is revealed. I pull my flashlight and flash it down the hallway. The air is musty and feels stagnant and stifling, like it hasn't moved in years. I raise my flashlight upwards and light the long, narrow passage stretching out beyond the reach of our beams. The hallway is typical, with concrete walls and rusted pipes and rusted conduits of age-old wiring. Our footfalls cause the only sounds, echoing hollowly in the empty corridor. By this time, we've started to see the heavy metal doors that flank either side of the corridor, much like the entrance to the bunker. We count the doors as we walk trying to match them up with the layout we found in the blueprint. By the time we reach the end of the corridor and our flashlight beams have lit six of them, we have our answer. We make our way back through the hallway again and come to the first door. It requires some effort to push the heavy door open and it loudly creaks on its hinges, the noise shattering the silence of the corridor. My flashlight plays over the interior and I can see that it's a small room, completely unfurnished, there's a small metal chair in the middle of the room and what looks to be a small table beside it. The walls of the room are all concrete and I shiver at the thoughts of what sort of nefarious use this austere room would have. The room we find ourselves in next looks to be a storage room of some sort, with shelves lining the walls and stacked full of boxes and sealed containers. As we move through the clutter, we open a few of them and find personal effects within. Clothing, small keepsakes, and in a few cases, old and yellowed photographs. Every one of them a chilling reminder of the people whose lives were taken from them by our previous housemate. The third door opens to what looks like a study of some sort. There's a large wooden desk in the middle of the room, similar to the one in the main room, and the walls are lined with bookshelves, filled with books and files. I pick one of the books up and thumb through it. Titles like the Psychological Study of Serial Killing, Criminal Profiling Techniques, and Aberrant Human Behavior Patterns jump off the pages at me. The file folders look to be full of research and case notes written up in detail, hundreds of pages long. I feel sure that they'll match the horrifying content of the audio tapes. 
the fourth and fifth doors on the left both open into more of the same living quarters with beds, wardrobes, and additional personal affects. At long last, the sixth door leads us into some kind of sick bay. There's a gurney in the middle of the room, and a cruel-looking examination lamp hangs over it menacingly. Various medical devices and implements are strewn about the room, and there is a strong smell of antiseptic in the air, with something else beneath it, something that I can't quite put my finger on. The three of us leave that room and walk back out into the main bunker chamber, feeling a weight of dread and unease upon us greater now, the echoing familiar and the fear of what we have seen plaguing our steps. The shadows cover everything for far too short a time and now keep pace with us as we trot back to the main bunker room. My heart is heavy in my chest, and I feel it with bloody Paul. Like the man movie said, when we arrived back at the main room, we froze still in our tracks. Looking at the desk, the chair, and the sound equipment, they all looked and felt more ominous. This desk was where it happened, and all the while, the navigational blueprint had been propped up beside the terminal, and the Corridor B sign-out tags had been clearly visible the entire time. This is Corridor B, at the door there. Stone Cold puts a hand on the pitted steel of the heavy door. Lock it. He says through a smile it doesn't open. I raise an eyebrow and turn the handle myself, but the door doesn't move. I throw my body behind it, but still nothing. Amelia comes to my side, and together we test the door, but it is quite clear that it won't budge. Why it is locked, whether by time or design, we are unable to know, and I feel a chill at the prospect of what may be locked away within this room. For now, the truth of it remains a mystery. Maybe it's a good thing, adds Amelia. I can see the weariness in her face as she says it, and I have to agree. We've seen plenty of things down here that we never would have believed possible. We'll call the police, I tell her. They'll know what to do. They'll be able to figure out how to open the door. I take one last look back at the closed door to Corridor B, and we start climbing up, the sounds of the bunker falling away. When we finally reach the top, it feels like we have been down there for a week. I close the bunker door, and the outside noises sound alien after the heavy silence inside. On our way back to the house, though, I start to realize the implications of what we've seen. We're both looking for our phones now, and I'm breathlessly wrestling with mine, trying to wake it up and keep it that way. But nothing happens, and that little screen remains lifeless and dark, no matter how many times I thumb the button. Um, I can't get mine to, uh, turn on either, she says shakily, and holds out her phone to me, displaying the same blank screen. We don't say anything else, but rush straight to the garage and get in the car to drive to the authorities because we can't call them. I'm in the driver's seat with Amelia beside me, and the key is turned. Nothing. I try a second time, desperation filling me as the engine fails to catch. Why won't it start? Amelia asks with panic in her voice. Outside, it is blacker than black night, and I can no longer see the comforting outline of our country homestead. Let's do this. Let's search the house. Check every room. We all start with a jump at the next creak of floorboards, but as the minutes pass, the silence becomes more and more oppressive, almost maddening. You can feel the tension in it. The fear. We walk from room to room, finding nothing out of the ordinary. And then we start to see the little signs. A single apple is missing from the fruit bowl in the kitchen and one of the books we had brought down earlier has been moved back to the bookshelf from the coffee table. We look at each other, and we both know. There is something else here, in the house, with us. We continue with our search, checking the doors and windows for locks. And then, just as we are about to head on out, something flies through the hallway in a blur of motion. We both gasp, our hearts jumping as we hurry over into the hallway, finding nothing. A chill draft comes from the open window and goose pimples rise on my arms. I try to tell myself that they play tricks in old houses like this, but it's a lie. By the time we've headed back into our bedroom, the silence is oppressive and the darkness presses in around us. I don't feel as if we are alone in our home anymore, 
at least not entirely. I have a distinct impression that there is something, or perhaps someone, else here, just out of sight, ducking to avoid being seen. I lay in bed, unable to sleep, with the uncomfortable sensation of eyes upon me. The morning that follows is unbearably quiet. The sun is shining brightly through the windows in a way that seems almost out of place given the fear we experienced yesterday. The previous night was a fitful one, filled with terrible dreams and strange sounds. We decide to try our communication again. Hopefully my phone is working again, my connection has been restored like magic with the dawn. But no. Still no signal on either phone. I also try to call the car back over, but it just turns over and over, not trying to catch. We are alone. Discouraged but determined, we continue our search through the rest of the house, checking every nook and cranny for clues, anything out of place or signs of something strange. But nothing. Everything is just as it should be. The house is unchanged since the day we first set foot in it, and feels no different than the warm and inviting little place it always was not disclosing any of the dark and sinister secrets we've begun to suspect it has been keeping. But still, it's the small things, the things that seem barely noticeable. Stuff we know we left on a certain shelf isn't where we left it. The quiet sound of footsteps when we're just sitting still. Things on the wall moving and shadows adjusting somehow without reason. Those bits of chaos, disorder, however subtle they may be, however often we notice them, they are still enough to set our hairs on end and silently confirm our greatest dread. We are not the only souls haunting the rooms of this house. We need to get back to the bunker. At least now we know there are more questions that need to be answered. We stop at the doorway to Corridor B, entering the final room of the bunker and finding ourselves in this most mysterious of areas. Intrigued, we take a few more steps towards it and Amelia reaches out and depresses the handle, but the door remains defiantly unmoving. I move to stand next to her and push my own weight into the door handle, but it might as well be welded shut. That's not going to open, I tell them, stepping back and looking at the door, shaking my head. The shed behind the house should still hold some tools, I think to myself. I believe there were some crowbars and hammers and such, a bit rusted perhaps. The previous tenants must have left them. I suggest it to Amelia, and she reluctantly agrees. I head back up to the surface, the bright sunlight making me squint. I rummage through the dusty tools in the shed and pick a heavy crowbar and a hammer. Amelia is on the steps leading down to the lower bunker when I return and join her. She looks worried, and I must admit that I am feeling a bit uneasy as well. We head back down together. I stood in front of the open doorway and wedged the crowbar into the tight gap between it and the frame. The metal protested against the weight of the door that sat upon it. Gathering myself, I put my weight into the bar, and there was an initial creaking sound followed by the sound of the door groaning back into the bunker in response to my efforts. Finally, the door began to screech along the edge of the opening. We shine our lights into the open mouth of Corridor B, the path that we've not been able to see before now. With a groan of protest, the door swings inward, and I find myself looking down the length of Corridor B, and it's like nothing I've seen so far in this bunker. I thought the halls and rooms thus far had been filled with old refuse and unused journals and equipment, but seemingly inexplicably, the closet is well swept, and the floor is uncovered by the dust and debris found in other areas of the bunker. We shine our flashlights down the hallway. It stretches even deeper into the bowels of the bunker than Corridor A. And there are more of those closed doors, lining both walls of the corridor. Amelia steps towards the first door, shining her flashlight along the cold metal of it. She reaches out a hand to touch it, but pulls her hand back quickly, like it had burned her. It's warm, she says quietly. I lay my palm to the door. And it is, as Amelia said, it seems warm, like the room on the inside is heated. I move to the next door and place my hand there as well. They have been occupied recently. We both turn and look out along the hallway, suddenly very aware of our surroundings. Do you... 
Do you think it's him? said Amelia, her voice little more than a breath, eyes wide with terror and shock. I breathe in heavily, tightening my grip on the flashlight. You mean the former owner? I nod, a lock of hair falling across my face. Yes, I think. Who else could it be? These rooms are obviously being used. And what we have found in the bunker and now, it fits. I can feel my heartbeat in my chest as I slowly nod. I think you may be correct, Amelia. It is possible. He could have been here, hiding, for all this time. The silence that follows is deafening, the temperature within the bunker suddenly cold. We have been living on top of a man with such a dark and evil past. I can feel the skin on my neck and arms prickling at the thought of the man who performed the atrocities in these recordings, knowing that it's possible he could be down here, in the bunker, with us. We stood there for another moment, letting it sink in. So we get to the first door and get ready to check out the room beyond. I extend my hand and grasp the frigid metal handle of the first door. Holding a breath for a brief moment, I rotate an outward push, the door pushing out of the prize with atonal metal groan, and it swings open into the room. The door creaks inwards, and we bring our flashlights to bear, shining them within. A flashlight room is revealed, this one a good-sized space that almost could be the interior of an old apartment or living space, if it weren't for the rest of the bunker layout we've seen so far. This one is relatively clean and organized, with signs that it has been used and lived in much more recently than the general condition of the rest of these bunkers. In one corner is a cot with the blankets neatly pulled up, and folded at the end of it is a plain wool blanket. Beside it is a small table and chair, and on the table are a well-used cup, a few books, and a notebook with a pen laid beside it. Directly across from that was a small kitchenette area where a hot plate and kettle were set up next to a shelf filled with various canned food items. Amelia enters the room and shines her light around, heading further inside. She collects the notebook from the table and opens it, showing the pages of the same neat handwriting. More of the journals, she says, voice quivering. I step up next to her on the other side of the table and look over her other shoulder at the open journal. The entries are recent, the ink not yet faded. We both look at each other, the weight of the situation seeming to grow. Out of nowhere, that frozen sound thwacks loud enough to stop us dead in our tracks, and I know that the corridor door just closed behind us with an echoing creak in this metal tomb. We both look at each other with wide eyes in sudden horror. The door had been open when we came in. I don't think either of us had even taken the time to close it behind us. An icy chill runs down my spine as we both reach the same awful conclusion. The air grows cold as we begin to realize the severity of our situation. We are not by ourselves down here in this damned makeshift bunker. Just behind us, the door to the corridor slams closed. In silence, we both move closer to the door, and my footfalls sound far too loud in the stifling quiet. The knob is chill to my touch, and I glance at Amelia before I begin to rotate it open, a gnawing dread building in my gut. When we open the door, a cool breeze from the hallway beyond meets us, and I involuntarily shiver. The only sound is the pounding of our hearts, loud in our ears as we stand in the confining office. We raise our mags and tentatively retreat back out into the dim room with our flashlights. The bunker is still quiet, still empty. No one along the corridor leading to the next room. The door to the second room is still closed, just as we left it. The air is heavy and stifling in its quiet threat, and I can hear nothing but my own and Turner's shallow breathing. Together we move to the closed door at the end of the hallway, both of us having the irrational expectation that some unseen thing is going to leap out of the darkness and tear us to pieces. Amelia is gripping my arm so tightly now, and the beam of her flashlight is jerking around all over the place, playing across the walls, ceiling, and floor with the movement of her shaking hand. We need to check the second room, she says quietly, breathlessly, but with determination. I nod. I understand. 
We must investigate, I say quietly, trying to sound reassuring. We all take a collective breath and move forward to the last door along Corridor B. With each step, my fear of the unknown seems to grow more and more, but my need to know what is happening here pushes me forward. I can't help but feel like we are being watched, as if someone's eyes are on us, but I see no signs of anyone else here with us, hidden in the shadows. When I reach the second door, I feel my fingers close around the cold handle and a sick feeling washes over me. The thought that we may not be alone down here and the possibility that someone, maybe even the old owner, is using this underground space in the same way we are chills me to the bone. I let out a long breath and reach out to push the door inward, the hinges groaning loudly and echoing eerily down the corridor. And then we are in the room, lights playing out in front of us, casting long shadows from the bobbing beams along the walls. It's a larger room than the first one and looks more ordered and inhabited. The layout is similar to the first room, with the bed, small kitchenette, and desk. None of that is terribly important right now, however. What is important is the figure slumped over the desk at the far end of the room. A man. He's hunched over something, and I can tell from his posture that he's entirely unaware of our approach. Well-dressed in shabby clothes and with a wild gray shock of unkept hair, he hasn't turned around after we walked in, but is just hunched over his desk, busily writing something in a notebook. Amelia gasps and tightens her grip on my arm, and I feel the color drain from my face as I recognize him. It is him. The man from the tapes. The previous owner of our house. In the doorway we freeze, the thoughts racing through our minds and our hearts pounding frantically. Fear grips us tightly, and we can hardly breathe. The videos, the confessions, the crimes, they all lead back to this man. He is not some long-dead specter. He is here now, before us. His fingers pause above the notepad, and the quiet somehow grows louder in the room. Turning his gaze aside, his chair creaks in protest, and he raises his head, revealing a weathered face with cold, steely eyes. A flash of his eyes up to us, and the hint of a chilling smile appears on his lips. Ah, I take it you have discovered my little secret, he offers, exactly like the voice on the recording. When the man's ice-cold voice finishes echoing around the room, he springs forward towards us with a fierce and wild look in his eyes, a snarling grin marring his otherwise dead-set face. Fear immediately overwhelms us in the split second before adrenaline drowns out all rational thought. There's no planning, no thinking, only acting. I step in front of Amelia, trying to fend off the man, to keep him from getting to her. He's stronger than I'd have thought for his age, and he's maintaining a vice-like hold upon my arm. Chaos fills the room as we struggle, and I lose my grip on our flashlight and it falls from my hand, casting wild, flickering shadows along the ground as it rolls away. Michael! cries Amelia in a high, desperate voice, but with a steely edge. She is frightened, yes, but she is also not without her own courage. In a flash, she has snatched up the fallen flashlight and is bringing it down hard on the man's arm that is grasping me. He grunts, and I feel his grip slacken. Without hesitation, I drive my elbow backward into his ribs, pushing myself away from him and spinning around to face him as he stumbles back a step. I can tell he is about to charge me again, and I throw forward one of my own, and the two of us start grappling, each trying to get a better hold, anything to overcome the other. Amelia's voice is the only thing that keeps me from losing my mind to fear and confusion. John, she says, somehow breathless but with a tone of determination in her voice. I see her pick up what looks like a heavy piece of metal from the desk. A paperweight, maybe. Duck! Michael! She cries out, and I don't even think what she's meaning before I'm hitting the floor. As fast as anything I've ever seen, I watch her bring that piece of metal around with everything she has, and it smacks the man alongside his head with a sickening thud, sending him staggering back, eyes rolling momentarily. Taking advantage of the opening, Amelia swings once more and clubs him again, dropping him to the floor and sending him into unconsciousness. 
We're both panting heavily, the rush of fight or flight still in our systems. Amelia throws the metal object to the side and runs over to me. With the direct threat ended, we need to make sure we're safe. Our breath is heavy, and we're both shaking from the adrenaline. I need to get out of here and back to the police, get better help. I grab my phone, but I still have no signal. We need to get out of this shelter, out of this house, call the police. Amelia, I hiss, we have to get out of here, now. I nod. Come on. We make our way back through the bunker and up the stairs, coming back out into the open air. We need to get help. We need to get to a neighbor or a town, some place where there's a phone signal. We need to tell the police about this guy under our house, the fucked up audio recordings, the murders. We quickly grab a few things from the house and make sure to lock the door before leaving. The car doesn't start, so we don't have a whole lot of options here except to keep walking. As we depart in the gloom of the early evening, fear and exhaustion bear down on us, but we don't dare slow down. All around us, the peaceful quiet of the countryside seems to grow suddenly menacing, and I can hear nothing but the wind in the trees and the racing beat of our hearts, except for an occasional hoot of an owl from somewhere unseen in the dark. Amelia and I are hiking across the countryside, such as it is, in rapidly approaching darkness out here. We're miles from the nearest neighbor, but we continue trudging along, following the dim illumination of the flashlight. We're both moving carefully over the rocky ground, looking at windows now, instead of trying to listen for anything. Our thoughts are racing a hundred miles an hour, and the man in that hiding place and the horror of how he's been living and what he's been doing this whole time once again feel like a nightmare that I'm desperate to wake up from. I pinch myself somewhere in my train of thought, and imagining the two of us somewhere safe and warm, heated blankets in a hospital room, this can't be anything but a bad dream. A nightmare. I have to open my eyes and check my surroundings again, my eyes racing all around in a panicked dread. The air is bitingly cold and filled with palpable fear, and my heart is hammering in my chest. We walked long hours across fields and through gently rolling low grass and sparse woodlands. It feels like hours, but eventually we see the warm glow of lights from a farmhouse up ahead, and I feel a surge of relief and hope, pushing my feet to drive harder. The light grows in intensity as we are drawn toward it. When we got to the farmhouse, our neighbors could only look at us in shock. We very quickly explained what had happened, and their faces went pale. They immediately sat us down and gave us their phone to call the police, keeping us warm while we waited, and comforting us as well. The police cruisers approach in the farmhouse pull-in, and the stillness of the rural soundscape is split with the muffled roar of radios and the boots-on-gravel sounds from the policemen as they unfold from the cars, the lines of their grim faces harsh in the bright light of the front-facing flashing lights. They do not look happy to see us, and I suppose I can't blame them, with what awaits them. Again, we tell them about how we found the bunker, the strange videotapes, and the man that we found and chased from the hidden space under our house. The cops listen carefully, and their faces grow darker with each word we speak. They tell us that they have it, and recommend that we stay with our neighbors for now. We can see a few of them heading back towards their cars and driving out to our place. Soon the red and blue lights are fading off into the night, and I'm left with a feeling of relief and unease. The other officers remain with us, questioning us further and trying to extract as much detail as they can. They go over every inch of our encounter with the thing, neither of the U.S. in-depth questioning I recount, again leaving us exhausted in their wake. We appreciate that it's necessary, but that doesn't make it any less tiring. At the same time, I can hear from the radio traffic that the officers have arrived at our location and are securing the house and making their way to the bunker. The man is still out, and they have found him just like we did. It seems he was the owner of the house before we bought it, and the sick lunatic responsible for what was on those tapes. Over the next few weeks, the police are out in force and have torn my idyllic country home apart, searching it with what I could only describe as a fine-tooth comb. The old man that lived here before us, the one from the bunker, 
is in jail now. I don't know all the specifics, but apparently they have plenty of evidence to charge him with a bunch of crimes. They have the recordings to prove it all. It's some relief to know that he's in custody now, and it somehow offers us a bit of closure to all that's happened down here below our house. It doesn't really make all the scars go away, though, I guess. Things have started to get back to normal for us, but we just can't shake the feeling of darkness brought by everything that happened. We've decided to sell the house and move someplace else, to try and make a fresh beginning. It's a little sad for us, because it was supposed to be our fresh new beginning when we bought it, but it just turned out to be a bad dream. Once our bags are packed, the feel of the house changes. I can almost hear the echoes of its horrific past in the darkened corners of the rooms, but there's a sense of relief that comes over us too, a feeling of surviving something, of setting right, some wrong that we never knew existed. We leave the house, the bunker, and the horrors of history. We move forward. Things will be at peace again. We leave the open fields and quiet serenity of the rural areas as we drive away, the sun setting and promising a new day. 